Are you right? <laughs> How are you? Yeah, I'm all right. Do you know what? I actually, the last few days, I, I feel like I've woken up with a hangover, though, because I have been drinking quite a lot. <laughs> but I've hardly touched it since I've been locked down. And I went over to the shop early. I bought a beer, had one sip, and I was just like, that tastes the best thing ever. Oh, my God, yeah. I was like, I've missed beer so much. So. I think probably for the last week, I've constantly been 10% pissed, like, all the time. That's bad. And before, before this all happened, I was literally being the most healthy. I was doing like yoga twice a day. I was running. I was a vegan. I've been eating bacon. I've been drinking gin every day. <laughs> I've gone off the rails. We need to get Harriet some gigs quickly. <laughs> the whole career just disappears. MCID. <laughs> so tell me what you've been doing since we've been on lockdown. Has your life changed that much? Yeah, it has, because I, I, I can't go to work or anything. All the gigs have been cancelled, obviously, so it's literally like lockdown for me. Mm. Like, keeping it at home, trying to exercise. I've been cycling a lot. And do you find some days, like, you see people posting all this, like, motivational stuff, like, you should get up, you should do this. I just Some days I just can't find the motivation. Honestly, I was saying this to someone the other day. I, I don't really have a middle ground at the moment. Some days I'm like working myself into the ground and then other days like I can't get dressed. Yeah, yeah. But you shouldn't feel bad about that. No, see, that's the other thing. Like that I quickly, once I recognise that, those days that are not productive, I just, I've just learned to just like allow it. Yeah, yeah, 100%. There's no point feeling guilty. No. It's, it's the one time where us people that, you know, work all night all the time can actually just fucking chill out. <laughs> the first week was horrific. I just ate everything in the cupboard. Did you? So um, you've, you've been down like a bit of a slope and you've got back up? Uh, massively. Literally, yeah. the first week was just, I wish I could just reverse that. I feel like I'm still in that phase. <laughs> <laughs> I've been baking cakes and just eating them. What to yourself? So, what have I been doing? Yeah, apart from boozing. Um, well, I've been weirdly busier than I was before. Yeah, you've done this, and I, I'm really happy that like the people I saw in your stories that are getting involved now, it's wicked. Yeah, and actually, I never wanted to do it for like hits, do you know what I mean? I, I just wanted to do something that was actually kind of valuable. I wasn't expecting to learn stuff myself from everyone but you actually realize that most of the time when we all see each other we're normally a little bit drunk we're normally quite tired it's normally quite a loud distracting environment so like these sorts of conversations because like my mates that I speak to day to day they're not in the music industry Mm. so like to be able to have these chats outside of the context is actually like so interesting i've mm. learned so much from everyone i, I actually think, feel really lucky <laughs> yeah no and that's wicked i think with this because you see like people that you've not met you obviously follow your peers on social media yeah and you kind of build up like i've definitely done it like i kind of feel like i know what that person's about before i've met them and then yeah. when you meet them, they totally blow you away and you're like dude you're like you're so more insightful or interesting or you know, and it's, it's, it's always such a beautiful thing when you meet someone that you like musically and they also are really kind of, you really get on with and vibe with as well. It feels like drum and bass is a community even when no one's playing shows, do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's actually such a good point. 2020 obviously has been catastrophic. Yes. We were, we were together in Australia on New Year's Eve. We were, and then I saw you again in Newcastle, I think. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, oh my God, that was this year, wasn't it? Yeah. I feel like I've got PTSD and have just written off everything that's happened in 2020. <laughs> well, Australia was a pretty, pretty good time, wasn't it? Like, that, those shows were pretty amazing. So, yeah. That they, New Year's Eve show, um, Origin. So good. So good. Yeah, so good. Perth, Perth for drum and bass is real. Would you say that that's like the main hub of the genre in Australia? Yeah, Perth is definitely the home of Jungle Drum and Bass. Um, I think mainly because of the Origin guys and other promoters there. 
have just really pushed it, you know, yeah. and created a scene there. Um, and, you know, to have parties the size they do with drum and bass artists, it's crazy. But they're all great, you know, Sydney's great, Melbourne's great, mm. but you know when you come into Perth, you know it's going to be a turnout and it's going to be lashing, do you know what I mean? So how many times have you actually done Australia now? I couldn't tell you, at least five, six times. Wow, that's amazing. And then there's New Zealand, which is like, which was the biggest shock for me to go there and to it's be walking crazy down like. Australia, right? New Zealand, <laughs> I feel like drum and bass is bigger there than it is here because the population is so small. Um, so I was walking down like the high street in Auckland. Mm. And there were hairdressers, shoe shops, and that they were all playing drum and bass. Like, not all of them. But I, I certainly wouldn't expect that here. No, I think it's really kind of blown there the last few years. I mean, every time we've gone, it's been good. But the last few times have just been kind of like up here. Do you know what I mean? For reaction and stuff. We, have, you, have you like, did you spend any time there? No. Not I've seen, we, me and Nick have done uh, like a little tourist holiday there. Have you? Yeah, yeah, with Joe I from Nick. I so want to do that. It was so good. We got we do, we just went round all these like kind of uh, like tourist spots and just. Did you go of... to the Hobbit House? No, oh. I, everyone. No one wanted. Well, no one wanted to go with me. Oh my god! Like I'm obsessed with Lord of the Rings. <laughs> well, we Next time. I'm so up for that. <laughs> Being able to go to the other side of the world, be treated with the hospitality that you do get as being almost like a guest. Um, yeah. And essentially kind of, okay, so maybe I wouldn't come back with loads of money, but like to essentially not actually have to pay for it, for me is like winning. 100%. And, and, and that's why I think going back to the people in this scene is you people do that, you know, you, you, you're willing to do that just to help push your thing. Do you know what I mean? And that's, that's, that's why I think it's so important with, with our music is it's, it feels like a, it feels like a kind of, it's built on that kind of vibe. It's, it's not just yeah. like, I'm going to come in at the top, I want to play the best shows. It's like, no, I've got to work for this. I've got to put the graft in. I've got to, you know, take less money to play shows that I want to play, you know? And that's, that's, that's why I think the people that do end up rising in drum and bass have really earned it, to be honest. And I think it, like, it goes the same for the promoters as well. Mm. Most of the promoters, especially, right? So I was like felt mad privileged that anyone would fly me over to the other side of the world to play like an hour set or whatever mm -hmm. um so the promote yeah so the promoters in new zealand most of their artists they're having to book from the uk or from europe yes. and the risk that they probably are taking financially but and they just and whenever you speak to them which you obviously as you know you do end up speaking to them in the car like you get when you get picked up from the airport and you, and you chat to them and the one thing that always resonates with me is that they're just doing it for the love of, of the music. Yeah, yeah. And without these people, we wouldn't have a scene in these countries and we wouldn't be able to go. So big up the promoters every time. In 2019, were there any like standout shows for you? Or was there anywhere that you hadn't travelled to before last year? Uh, I don't know about anywhere I've not travelled to before, but standout shows, definitely Warehouse Project. Like, ridiculous lineup. I don't, right? know if, I don't know if I actually ended up seeing you there. No, because it's so big. Yeah. But we that, won, that was, like, the best night of my life. <laughs> yeah. It was amazing. Like, it was so good. I remember we went, we went back to back with Adam and Mark, uh, Wilkinson and Adapt. Yep. And it, by that time, we'd been back to back a few times, so the show was working really well. And all the boys came up and yeah, that was definitely a highlight. Just the size of the place and the vibe. You did a back to back, right? With Nikki. I played in the dep in the main room. Um we opened it with Nikki and North Base. Nice, nice. Um but on but you know, so we opened that room, so I saw it empty. And within yeah. twenty That's... minutes it was like because I was like, Am I gonna end up playing to anyone? I don't really know, don't really mind. Just, yeah. I'm on Warehouse Project, it's fine. Um, but by the end of it, by the end of the set, like, the room, the room looked pretty full. 
which was crazy. That was, we played eight till nine in the, in the evening, 8 p.m. till 9 p.m. That's crazy. And it went on till like four in the morning oh. and it was still rammed at the end. I, I, I got there at about half seven at night and I left at about five in the morning. No way. To be honest, so do I. And I That's the first time I've done that. that. <laughs> you know what we had to do the next day? What? So woke up, I had my car, got in the car to drive to, uh, I think it was like Luton Airport from Manchester, get on a plane and fly somewhere mad in like Poland or somewhere and play another gig. And Did yeah, I was a bit you? worse than that the next day. I've only ever seen you piss one. No, you haven't. What? That rampage. Oh, God. Yeah, I yeah. was. You were just <laughs> cut in this bottle of rum. Well, when we were in Newcastle... Were you I, drunk? No, but I'd done something the night before and I was suffering. <laughs> I remember being in the car um, on the way back because basically, cause me, you and Nick were all in the same hotel and and then everyone was... Like, they were, they were a good group of guys up there in Newcastle. Like, they... More promoters that just love what they do. Yeah, mm -hmm. like proper veterans. So they, it was really good conversation. So we were obviously all sticking around. But I remember like you and Nick came off. I wasn't even going to stay for your set because I knew I felt really ropey. And then I didn't want to get the promoter to drive me back and then have to come back and get you. So I was like, right, I'll just, I'll just wait. I'll just wait. I'll just wait. And then I just felt worse and worse. And I remember coming over to you and being like, can we go? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you obviously travel a lot. Yeah. How long have you? How how long do you think it's been that you've actually been kind of flying around most months? Uh, quite early. Like I, it started rolling like really quick for me. Um, I was just like local, like doing my thing at like a night called Devotion. That Fantasy used to run in Brighton. What was it called? Devotion. Right. And, um, but he like these two people, Sarah and Matt run it for him. And from then it just kind of like from being on those lineups, just popped. I just met a lot of people through that night. Cause I was the resident MC with a guy called Bruno and, um, it just popped. So I was traveling like 23 onwards. It's quite young. Yeah. And so I met what year was that then? I don't want to know. <laughs> How are you going to draw me out like that? Come on. <laughs> Come on. Um, yeah, and then I met Nick and it just went, whew. So, yeah. What travel hacks have you, like, have you learned over the years? Because I, last year for me, like, my travelling went like this. And I did a lot more long haul and stuff. And I quickly learned the mistakes I was making. What mistake did you make? Um, so one of them was going in an airport and free security, you need easy access to certain things. One of them is obviously your passport. Laptop, is, you have to have easy access yep. to your laptop. You need a to set put it in the tray. thing, because you have to have that out every time. Always, also, travel, don't use a pers like a antiperspirant, use a, a deodorant stick, because you don't have to take that out. Always try and fly with One World or Star Alliance. There's like two airline groups. Oh. The British Airways is One World. And if you collect air miles with British Airways, that they transfer over to every single other airline on one way. I look. For, I can't wait. I can't wait till I've got air miles. You you'd have some now if you just start collecting them. You've been flying. Yeah, with EasyJet. Right, with EasyJet, I've done. Well, you flew to Australia with EasyJet. Right. This is one of the worst times of of my like travelling work life. Right. Yeah. So. Christmas, just before Christmas, me and Nick have got shows in New Zealand, Australia. I've got to fly to Auckland, first gig. Flat like, cool, left my yard, like day before like, Christmas Eve. Fly to Dubai, land, and I'm like, there's like a warning about sandstorms. I'm like, oh, it's cool, but it's tight, the connection's tight. So I start sprinting up the like, and you know what Dubai's like, it's just one long terminal. I'm sprinting, like, just leaving everyone in my dust, just like, get out of the fucking way, get to the gate, scan my boarding pass, just goes, bah, bah. I was like, sorry, I'm, I'm on, booked on this plane, I've made it, you're still boarding, it's like, no, 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 there's been uh, sand so actually this is yesterday's passengers that missed their flight, getting on, you're not getting on this plane, I was like, I've got to be in Auckland, I've got a gig, I, I land, 
the night before the show, I need to be there. And they were like, that ain't happened. So I was like, cool. I was like, you've got my suitcase. I literally had the clothes on my back and my like, you know, entertainment for the flights in my backpack. And they were like, yeah, we'll hook you up with a hotel off site. So you've got, so I got taken to this hotel. This was Christmas day. So I spent oh. Christmas day on my own in a janky Dubai hotel room. And I just sat at the bar and got pretty smashed because I was like, this is the worst Christmas day of my life. Woke up the next day, literally was like, I'm just going to go home because this is like ridiculous. What's the Did you have a whole tour booked? Or? Whole tour booked. Like, I thought, no, do you know what? They've said go to the airport, so I'll go to the airport. But everything above my flight was pretty much cancelled. Went through, scammed my boarding pass. They were like, yeah, yeah, your flight's going to go. I was like, are you joking? Like, yes wicked and you know how long that flight from dubai to auckland is 18 like, hours yeah so long so something another plane for 18 hours bear in mind i've been i left my house two days ago and i've not changed my clothes <laughs> the glamour everybody this is the glamour of touring. yeah and then i landed and they were like the guy picked me up to take me to the festival and i was like yes yeah, so we go to the hotel i just need a shower man he's get changed bad like because i've been in these clothes for two days yeah. and they were like they were like, no, we've got to take you straight there. I was like, sorry. <laughs> literally got taken straight to the festival. Nick had to start playing because the set had started. And I literally walked on stage halfway through the set and went, all right. And that was it. Played the set in the same clothes. That you left a, your house in? That I'd left my house in, literally. <laughs> and then, oh, my God. And literally, like, Nick was just like, I can't believe you've actually made this. It's ridiculous. Do you know what I do now? A spare pair of clothes in my hand. See, that's that's what people don't realise. It's not all it's not all ease and glamour. You're not getting driven, chauffeur driven to gigs every night of the week. I am constantly, constantly getting changed in a pub in public toilets, <laughs> like all the time. And I even have a I even have like a knack of like how because I don't want any of my stuff to touch the floor. Yes, yes. So I'm like, so I like use the hook. Like, I have a knack of, like, how, like, I keep it all, like, off the floor. I'm not touching any germs. And then I've just got to the point now where, like, I'll um, go out in, like, a services to where all the sinks are. Just lay yeah. out all my makeup and people coming in and out looking at me like, she, like so you, is she you, a hooker? <laughs> there is a lot of the time where I'm like, maybe one day, one day I'll have, like, this and that, and I won't have to do this anymore. But maybe I secretly <laughs> like it. <laughs> when you say that, I mean, I'm still literally walking out of gigs, and before I get in the car to go home, I have to like change my sweaty t shirt in the middle of winter, just like shivering. Yeah. Next to my car, just like, <laughs> Hoping that no ravers walk past your car whilst you've like got your nipples it's out. <laughs> this is interesting. What's your ritual when you get home from a gig? It's just like seven in the morning, you've been on the road all night, you've played two shows, you're shattered. What's your little ritual when you get in home? Do you have a cup of tea? Do you just, do you eat something? No, well... Straight into the bedroom and that's it. No, see, I think there was a time when I was younger where I was able to just take off my clothes, get into bed and just go to sleep. Mm -hmm. But now, like, I don't know why this has come with age or what, but, like, now it's very much... I have to feel like everything's good before I can sleep. I normally will have something like toast as well. Yeah. Peanut butter, on toast. peanut butter on toast and like a cup of tea. A comforting program on to fall asleep to as well. Yeah, I can't sleep after gigs because I usually have the music ringing in my ears because I, yes. always, I, always I always start my set with earplugs and then within 10 minutes they are out. Same. <laughs> I, I, no, not happening. You're a DJ. Yeah. You I know, it's terrible, isn't it? I, there's right. been a few recently as well where I've really suffered after with, for not... Mm. Um, I, I just go wild I turn the monitor right up and I'm like in the zone and I'm like fuck everything else then I'm aware I'm aware XO I was just like leaning this way just the sheer sound I was just like jeez the worst time is when there's only a monitor on one side and you turn it right up mm. and you get in the car to go home and it's like having vertigo because you've got the ringing but it's only on one side I want to know what got you to where you are now really i mean 
like were you a fan of this music what did you used to go yeah. out and party what oh, i need to i need to know what era that was because i need to visualize like so I was, going going out 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 the, I was going out in early 2000s yeah early 2000s like and we me and my boys used to just go clubs around here or raves around here we had meltdown um we had devotion around here being Brighton, where I live. Brighton, yep. Many a fine drum and bass man has come from. <laughs> um, yeah, like Friction lives like five minutes away from me. Um, and yeah, so I started like going out with my boys, usual. I'm not going to go into too much details of what we are getting up to. We were just going out, having a good time, raving, do you know what I mean? Having a great time. So your time. mates were, were on the same vibes music-wise as you, like... Yeah, we were all like a little clique and we all just used to, before we were old enough to go raving or not even old enough, before we were old enough to all of us get into a club, we used to sit around listening to tape packs. Um, and then my mate got Dex, my mate Paul got Dex and we started just like doing the bedroom thing. And then so I was already kind of doing it before I even went to my first drum and bass night because I was so young when I started listening to it. And then... Obviously, went to a few drum and bass nights, got even more inspired, just seeing these idols that you'd listen to on tapes, these MCs and that. Like who? Fearless, for me. Yeah. Was always, like, I think he is one of the best MCs. Fearless and IC3, like, those guys, come on, you know Roger. Like, yeah. a, like he's the nicest guy ever. I love Roger. IC3 is legit, like, the nicest guy I've ever met in this genre of music ever. He's like, got great I, energy as well. He's always happy and he's always yeah. positive and he's yeah. always and he'll always support everyone. Do you know what I mean? Like there's a bunch of other people that have supported me and they know who they are. But in terms of people I've met that like, I've really idolised, like Roger was one of them. I was just like, I see three is a guy, like it's yeah. an absolute dude. So yeah, just started going out and then I just started like impersonating MCs, just being like you know, just because I like what they do. And then everyone said, oh, you're pretty good at that. You should just start writing your own stuff. And I did. And do you then, think your voice was different then? Because it's quite deep now. Has it always been like that? It was always deep. It's not as deep as it was now. It was a lot mm. higher. And um, I think when you first MC in, you don't really know about control of your voice. Do you know what I mean? So I was very shouty. And I listened to old sets of myself and I hate it. Because I'm just like, I hate it. Like, that one little thing, I'll say one thing and I'm like, through it. Everything's ruined. Uh, <laughs> it's like if, to the, have the normal person they're just listening to it and they don't really clock it. But I think I just learned over the years, you just learn control. And also, I work, I work with one person solidly for the past 11 years. So I really know what he's doing and he knows what I'm doing and we vibe off each other. And, you know, we create a show. That's what we like to try and do. It's not just one random DJ with another random MC, do you know what I mean? It's, we thought about this. We put a lot of time and effort into, you know, Nick puts a lot of time and effort into finding tunes and working out mixes that he wants to do. And I put a lot of time and effort once he's done that into, right, what can I fit here? What can I do there? Right, he does that mix there. How can I set that up? And that's, that's what's grown over time, that learning of, of what to say and when to say it. I've had a lot of good advice over the years and there's one piece of advice that has been the best. It's not what you say, it's when you say it. Definitely. I've watched MCs, 100 million bars, and they're sick. Don't get me wrong, the bars are sick. But then I've watched GQ come on, say two words before a drop and the whole raid has just turned into a zoo. And it's like, that's the guy, you know? It's a timing thing. It's a timing thing. And it's about, it's about realising the tone of the rave, like the, the vibe of the tune that's going to come in. You know, if it's a dark tune, you want to get people ready to like switch it, do you know what I mean? And it's, yeah, it's just about being really aware of the vibe of what's being played and what people's moods are and what they're vibing to, you know? It's a lot deeper than just write some bars and get out there and spit them, you know? And that person G's you up and then you drop yeah. a mix and G's them up. You're both kind of bringing each other up and up. So the levels go up and then you're both there just like really into it. And people get yeah. that. That's what I think. People really feel that energy. When, when an MC and a DJ connect really well, people really feel that energy. And I think that's where me and Nick are so lucky where we've done it for so long. 
people kind of know the energy they're going to get because we always bring that energy. He's always trying to outdo me and I'm always trying to like set him up neatly. Do you know what I mean? So we're always trying to push it. And that's people vibe off that, you know, it's important yeah. to push that, you know. How did you and Nick come about? So you and, you and Subfocus, like how, how did that happen? I think this is my most answered question. So, is it? Oh God, yeah. I'm asking you cliche questions. <laughs> no, 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 no. Do you know what? It's cool because it's, I don't really do interviews, so we don't really talk about it much. I mean, much. I would personally like to know as well. <laughs> you know, like it was, it was, uh, it was, it was, it's not that interesting, but it, it was very natural. We, it was very, it was like, it was very mutual, which was good. So we started, I, he was like, just doing his thing. And we both had the same agent at the time, a guy called Obi at Echo Location. And um, Nick was kind of looking for someone a bit more full time. I think um, Ray, uh, Rage had just gone with Chase and Status. And I think he'd seen the benefits of having his own, M of them having their own MC. And I think he was maybe a bit like, okay, let me look for someone. And if there's someone good, then we could possibly do something. And I, I was a fan of his music long before I worked for him, obviously. You know, tunes like Juno, Frozen Solid, x-ray like absolute monsters do you know what i mean yeah yeah and then obviously i got the chance to work with him and i was like oh, this is like, it's like one of my favorite producers this is going to be insane and it just like worked really well like better than i could have ever thought and then the next minute i'm getting a phone call from obi going do you want you've got a meeting with sub focus at his studio and then we talked it out i was obviously like hell yeah <laughs> he was like yeah let's do it and yeah, and then we never look back since. We just there's very rarely I meet someone from the scene that I think is an idiot. You know, I'm pretty much the majority of people I meet, I'm like, are all safe and just we're all on the same page, you know. Touched upon this with like with quite a lot of other people as well, and it is like the drum and bass scene is very unique in the sense of the passion and protection and kind of protectiveness yes that everyone has around it yeah sometimes it manifests in maybe in, in interesting ways from maybe like s followers or fans but i think the intention is always kind of the same you always i think you can it always comes back to the rave and that's for me it was it's like you can have the most followers on Instagram, you can, you know, have the best image or whatever, but unless you kill it in the rave, you ain't killing it, do you know what I mean? It don't really matter. And that's, that's what I think. And there's another, another saying that someone always told me, and it's like, if you go on to bigger things and you start getting a bit more commercial success, um, which, you know, a lot of artists have, Chase and State is Pendulum, like, it's sub focus, hybrid minds, you know. Yeah. I've kind of they are now pushing the boundaries further than just the genre and and I think you could always you've always got to keep one foot in the rave you've always got to keep one foot in that where you came from you've always got to remember that this genre you you grew up with it you loved it you nurtured it and now it's nurturing you and it's loving you what is the most embarrassing thing that has happened to you when you've been emceeing I drop in the mic because I, I don't know, like, so I do this thing where I can spin the microphone around on my fingers. Nice. Really quick, just like, boom. And and I'm like, I kind of show off about it. Like, I'm like, <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> but one time I literally, like, fucking obviously rave for the people. And I'm just there trying to give it the style. And I just go, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they like, hear that as well. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm right pointing at me laughing. I'm just like, <laughs> you've got to get it back. You've got to pretend you're still cool. I've got some questions here from followers as well for you. Are they, are they nice questions? Yeah, yeah. Very, <laughs> very nice. So basically, um, I've got a lot, but I've picked my top three for cool. you. Some of them are quite interesting. So the first one is, how do you think, how do I word this? I'm going to word it in a way that makes more sense than what they've written. What part do you think an MC plays in the rave now compared to um, in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s, like that kind of era? I, I, do you know what? I think 
it's changed. It's definitely changed. But in a way, it's kind of gone full circle. Because back in the day, when I used to listen to like jungle sets and that, you'd have GQ and Felix just toasting. They'd host the mic for three hours over three different DJs. They'd toast it, do you know what I mean? And it would be just keeping the dance bubbling. Yeah. And then obviously the kind of the the kind of ninety eight jump up era happened, yeah. and, MC, and because the music kind of stripped down, the breaks kind of disappeared, and it went just more kick snare. The MCs were able to the tunes became a lot more minimal, so the MCs were able to just bar over the top. So that kind of birthed this whole kind of MC culture, which mm. I love. Mm. And I, I respect it. Some of the the lyrics these guys are writing at the top of their game is, are incredible, but I've always vibed off the hosting side of it. And now, like you say, you've got more MCs, well not more, but there's a there's more MCs than when I started doing that kind of working with one DJ, kind of promoting a vibe rather than just lyrics and stuff. It's about a show. It's about the whole thing as opposed to just, okay, I'm gonna get on stage, I'm just gonna roll out my bars and then that's it, do you know what I mean? And what I like the best about what I do is creating a vibe. You know, when Nick's about to drop an absolute banger and I can hear it coming in and the crowd don't know it, mm. I can set the scene for that tune and then watch that tune drop and just watch everyone react mad. Like, I'm just like, job done. I'm happy. That probably leads me on to the second question that I've got, um, which actually begins with MCID is number one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, it says, do you, so do you think there is a difference between an MC and a host? I mean, for me, an MC is an MC, but like, I guess like a lyrical MC and a host, like... I, I, do, I, think, I think a host for me is someone that doesn't really do any lyrics at all. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. just kind of say, big up, and but I think if you do bars, even where they're just on the build up or anything, if you, if you write lyrics and you perform them on stage, you're an MC as far as I can tell. I just actually really like having someone else on stage with me as well to just vibe with. Because you, you, it creates a vibe. It creates yeah. a, a relationship that people can see. And it's like, wow, those people are partying really hard and enjoying it. And that, invo that invokes that same emotion in the people watching. So I have a quick fire question round. Go and on. then I'm going to do this game with you. Where I'm going <laughs> to play you these songs. Um, Two minutes. Yeah, I'm going to get another drink. I'm going to get another drink. Uh, uh, yeah, same. <laughs> Wagwan. <laughs> um, right, so these questions just just answer with your first thought. <laughs> okay? They actually they're actually not that deep, so I think it'll be fine. So what's your best UK city? Best UK city what to play shows in? Or just like just in general. I love Bristol. Yeah, love. everyone says Bristol. Um best non UK city. Ooh, do you know what? We went there recently. I'm gonna go for Prague. Always a vibe. Yeah, someone else said Prague as well. Um, what's your see with you? Actually, I'm gonna change this question because I actually rate your music taste outside of drum and bass okay. um, a lot. And um, so, what is what what track are you listening to most at the moment? What's your favorite current track? Do you know what? I'm just gonna go because I love rap music, UK, American, whatever. I'm just going to go for a tune by Cheddar Bang called Office. Who's your favourite artist right now in drum and bass? Do you have one? K9 and K-Motion. Those two guys, they are doing it for me. Festivals or clubs? There's nothing quite like a little club where sweat's dripping off the walls and everyone's going off like proper tunes. With a proper sound system. Proper sound system. Whereas festivals, you play to more people and it's a beautiful sunset in afternoon, but you got to play a bit cheesier. Yeah. I'm going to go clubs. I'm going to okay. go clubs. Okay. I like the conviction there. Um, Nike or Adidas? Nike. Yeah. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Baths or showers? Showers. Your coffee? Neither. Squash. No, you just said you have a tea when you go home from a rave. Yeah, I have a tea, but it's not, I, drink, I drink squash by them. Bucket, well, okay, maybe. what what flavour squash do you have? Oh, see, you're getting it out of me now. It's just like the Vimto squash, man. Vimto? Vimto squash. Oh, I haven't had Vimto for ages. <laughs> when I was a you, I used to drink <laughs> well, I used to drink vodka Vim Vimto vodka. We had that's a name not, for it. What was that's it? A, that's an after party drink when like all the mixers run out. Cheeky vodka no. Cheeky Vim 
No. Cheeky okay. Vimto. It is a cheeky Yeah, Vimto. cheeky Vimto. Yeah. Um, do you voice note or text more? Call. Call? Over voice I, note or text? I, I just call people. What is your most used emoji? The one, the laughing face that's crying. What would you rather have, money or time? Time. What series are you watching at the moment? I'm re-watching Sopranos, but I just finished Ozark season three, and it was very good. Right, trains or planes? Trains. Trains. Security. Yeah. All right, that's the end of that. Right, are you ready? Yeah, yeah. So I need the title and the artist, right? Oh, okay. You hear that? Yeah, it's turbulence, isn't it? Bye. Ram Trilogy? No. No, I don't know. Anything you want. You get half a point for that. Okay. It's wow. Moving, moving, like moving Fusion. That's all right. <laughs> that was Shardai that I just played. Imagine if you... Shardai, damn. I've got okay. this... I've got this um, Jack's Off playlist that I do. I follow it. You do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I've, you've actually put me onto some tunes that I didn't know about, which not many people do. Oh, sick. That's, yeah. what, I, that's, what, I, that's what I want here. Yeah, that's so, what you want, because I, I, you, you've got taste in music. Yeah, you, you have, I, you know, I think we I'm have working. a very similar taste, actually, in our um, jacking off music. <laughs> I think the worst thing you could have done was call that thing jacks off. No, I think, that, I think that's, that's what it's about. It's funny. Yeah, I don't think the dudes that <laughs> think of Oh, jacking off to your Jackson off. Uh, that's what I'm saying, yeah. yeah. I'm going really. them. Right. Here we go. This, really. this one isn't going to be shot, eh? <laughs> I've underestimated I'm quick. I'm quick. Next one. <laughs> I was chasing stage remix. I'm good. Oh, what's it called? That's the status. Program is that the status? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, Oh, this Prima oh, Rapture. Five or six years ago, I inside here. I'm smashing this. I'm a man of circles, Hoda and Bryson. Right, you actually have done by far the best. And get this, get this, get this. And you're just an MC. Hey! <laughs> well done. See that, Nick? I think I did pretty good there. You did. I'm really impressed. Well done. Thank you. I've really enjoyed doing this. It's been awesome. It's been so nice to talk to you. Hopefully, it won't be too long till we see each other again. No, no, it won't be that long. Like, look, I, I think, so. fingers crossed, because I'm going to run out of money in three months' time, so I fucking hope we can get some gigs on the go. Cause oh, no. Yeah. Right then, well, I will um, chat to you soon. I will we'll let you know when this is going up. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. All right, well, I'll catch you soon. Cool. See you in a bit. Bye. Bye.